American History TV, only on C-SPAN 3. Next on Lectures in History, Kent State University professor Elaine France teaches a class about the experience of being arrested from the 1850s to the present day. She examines what groups were most likely to be arrested and how the process changed over time with the introduction of police sidearms and patrol vehicles. The class took place at the Trumbull Correctional Institution in Ohio as part of the National Inside Out Prison Exchange Program, which brings together college students and inmates for classes. This is about 90 minutes. So today we're going to be talking about the question of what it was like to be arrested. The subject is the arrest in the United States, 1880s to 2001. Now, the reason I chose that periodization is that we've been in class talking about the 19th century up through the 1880s um, with uh, our T.J. Stiles book and with our uh, Timothy Guilfoyle book. Um, and, uh, and I didn't want to go any past 2001 because... Uh, I think that there's so many people who have so much sort of living experience about uh, being arrested uh, in these last 20 years that it seems silly for a historian to begin to tackle it at this point. So I'm actually going to uh, be constraining my remarks to that period of time. And we're going to be asking the question of what is it like to be arrested during these times in history. Um, an arrest is a simple thing. Right? It seems like a simple thing. There's really a uh, few necessary elements to making something an arrest. Uh, the person making the arrest has to be a representative of the state. They must accuse a person of uh, committing an offense against the community. They must move them from the place uh, within to a place without the community um, after making their arrest. So it seems like a fairly simple process. Yet, we are absolutely fascinated with the scene of the arrest. Um, and this suggests that there is something more to the arrest that we want to understand. Um, uh, headlines about arrests ha always have grabbed attention. Okay. Uh, so I just, this, these are just several of the, the uh, headlines that I came through from the, mainly from the 20th century, late 19th and 20th century, headlines about arrests. But there are thousands and thousands of headlines about arrests, and we're all familiar with them from our daily newspapers. Um, and just think how many police procedurals we watch today. It seems like even reading about arrests in the newspaper or watching accounts of arrests on television news, how, the many different ways we hear about arrests, that's not enough. We also have to watch... Uh, dramatic representations of arrests, right? We have to, I mean, a whole bunch of different ways, you know, uh, hear music about arrests, right? Uh, arrests just seem to be very central to our, our culture, and this is, there's nothing new about that. These are just three, uh, three some of these will be familiar uh, to you guys. I think we're probably, I'm guessing, the thing that was familiar was Dragnet, right? Um, but, uh, but basically, it goes all the way back into, you know, the plays and, um, you know, cheap fiction published in the mid to late 19th century. A lot of that was, you know, thematized the importance of the arrest. Um, actually, one thing that's always struck me is that even if you're very familiar with arrests from, from your life, like from real life, even if you yourself have been arrested, you still spend a lot of time wanting to hear about and read about and watch other people being arrested or fictional accounts of other people being arrested. I think we talked about this in the class. Um, a lot of people who are incarcerated spend a lot of time uh, consuming popular cultural accounts of a criminal justice system, including um, a lot of arrests. <clears throat> Uh, so the arrest is so important in our culture, and it has been since uh, our nation's beginnings, even. Um, it is both a practical act, an arrest is a practical act. It's uh, the, the, the arrest or the threat of an arrest is one of the most direct, concrete, physical ways that a government can try to shape our behavior as citizens. An arrest is also a ritualistic Act. It's an act with a sort of a heavy meaning beyond a practical meaning. Um, it's a way that agents of the government can mark what behaviors, in what circumstances, by what people are outside of the community. 
and unacceptable. More directly than anything else, the possibility of the arrest um, has been um, how the state has controlled the behavior of people within the United States. Um, our nation was founded with a profound understanding of the centrality of the process of arrest to our political system. Uh, four out of ten of the amendments to our Constitution and the Bill of Rights are about the rights of uh, people who are accused of crimes, right? Um, including uh, the uh, you know rights related to when do people have the right to take you? When do people have the right to arrest you? The the founders were convinced that who the nation chose to arrest and how they made and executed that decision was one of the most important issues um, for the health of our country. And yet, uh, historians uh, have rarely spent a lot of time exploring the history of the arrest and how, to what extent it stays the same and to what extent it changes over time. And when they have done so, they have rarely done so from the perspective of the people most immediately involved in the arrest, right? That uh, actually we don't know very much about what police officers thought about and how they understood what they were doing when they were making arrests. That is, uh, there has been too little work done on that question. Um, <clears throat> but we also uh, don't have uh, very much uh, information at all, very much analysis at all, about how people who were arrested experienced that moment of arrest, which is both a practical moment and a moment of ritual. Uh, millions of police officers have clamped millions of handcuffs on millions of subjects and taken them away to tens and thousands of jails, and yet we know very little about what either police officers or those who are um, on the inside of the handcuffs uh, thought uh, and felt um, during that, that moment. Um, most of us in here agree, I think, that sometimes... Uh, even both today and in history, um, it has been good and necessary for the police to arrest people. Though it's important to keep that as an open question in our minds, consider what possible alternatives would be. Most of us also agree that people have sometimes uh, been arrested for the wrong reasons and in, uh, in wrong ways, um, and for reasons other than simply protecting other people and their property. Uh, most of us are well aware that policing has often been largely about maintaining social order, um, uh, what they used to call keeping the peace, right? As much as it's been about protecting, of stopping violent or uh, exploitative behavior. We are aware um, that often uh, arrests have um, heightened, have increased in response to social unrest. Um, when there's been major strikes, labor strikes, particularly earlier in the century, um, moments of demands for justice from certain oppressed minority groups, right, you know, largely African Americans, right, in our countries. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we know that um, order is often in the eyes of the beholder. And so policing has sometimes had a political content as well as an anti-crime function. And I think that's something that most people would broadly agree with. Um, uh, and I think it's that this broader significance of the arrest is why we all find it so fascinating and have to keep on looking at it again and again and again. Every day, thousands of arrests um, are constantly drawing a border around what authority figures imagine to be the community, revealing who is inside and who is outside um, of the law or the orderly community, who is allowed to participate and who must be removed from view. So let's look now at what it, what it appears uh, when we observe the border being drawn. So this class is going to approach this question of the arrest and what happens to the arrest from the perspective of the arrestee. Um, on another occasion, I, I will explore the perspective of police officers. Um, but here, I want to talk about the perspective of the arrestee. Um, we're looking at the arrest uh, from the receiving end, <laughs> the person who's being arrested. And we can see here three very different moments of arrest. They're actually um, from very different uh, periods of time as well. We see a, a violent arrest at a protest. Um, uh, 
we see a uh, this is a, a woman being arrested for street walking of sort of a vice arrest. Um, and we see uh, a, a guy who was arrested for um, uh, going on a high speed chase, misbehaving, trying to evade arrest after a night of, of drinking. Right. He seems to be, a, you know, you can see that the three people being arrested are being treated in very different ways, having very different kinds of experiences and uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons. OK, policing has evolved in a lot of practical ways that shaped what arrests looked like and felt like. I will stop keeping on going back there. Here we go. Let's start figuring out what the arrest is by looking at what it does and what it has done. Um, how has the experience of being arrest changed from the, uh, from the 1880s where Guilfoyle and Stiles left, uh, left, left off uh, through 2001? And how did it remain the same? And we're going to organize this. I swear, that top left-hand picture, it almost looks like it's a fake group of uh, police. But, you know, from the, I got from a very uh, reputable source, and I think maybe they just look like that. So, um, and, but different kinds of police in different eras. So we're going to ask five different questions. We're going to go through them in order. We're going to first ask, who was likely to be arrested during this period? Second, we'll ask, what were people arrested for? Third, we'll ask, how were people arrested? Fourth, we'll ask, how much control did people have um, over their arrest? What could they do? Is there any way that they could shape um, what happened during their arrest at different times? And then finally, we'll ask, how did people feel about being arrested? Now, that fifth one is one that we will uh, sort of fail to answer, right? We actually will we'll never quite get to that. But that's actually the question I most want to get at, right? So what I want to think, if you guys, you guys know that in this class, we largely do discussion, right? We're largely all about getting answers through active discussion. And so I want you to kind of think about this lecture as a really, really long discussion question, okay? What we're going to try to do is talk through some of the things that happened, some of the ways that being arrested changed and stayed the same over the century with the goal of coming to the end and working together to think through how people must have experienced arrest during these times. The reason that we have to come through it through this indirect way, <clears throat> it's really hard to get evidence about how people experienced arrest, right? Uh, People didn't tend to write it down, right? Where they did write down their experience of arrest, uh, people didn't tend to keep it, right? They weren't kept in nice archives where maybe the writings of more elite people might be kept, right? Um, and so we don't have very many written records of what arrests were like. And even when you start interviewing people, as I've been doing uh, recently, when you start interviewing people about being arrested, one thing that I've really noticed is that they tend to not tell you what it felt like to be arrested, even when you keep on asking them. And it took me a long time to try to figure out why that was. And then suddenly, it shouldn't have taken me that long. It, being arrested is a traumatic experience, or not always, but it can be a very traumatic experience. People do not like to remember it, and they do not like to talk about it. So it's really hard to get at this question of what it is like to be arrested. Nevertheless, <clears throat> We're going to make that effort today because I think it's very important, both for understanding people who were arrested and what their experiences were, but also I think that in understanding the arrest, it tells us a lot about the people who are inside the law, what they're avoiding, right, and why they're avoiding it, right, what they're afraid of, you know, why they don't step over that line um, to the outside of the law. Um, I think it's it's a really important question. Okay, so if you were arrested, I'm trying to remember which way to turn this so that here we go. Okay, so first we're asked who was arrested. Okay, um, the answer isn't simply immigrants. Um, there's a whole bunch of different answers to this question. Okay, if you were arrested at any time in history, the chances were that you fit pretty specific 
demographic characteristics. You can predict pretty well in any time in history who is most likely to be arrested. Okay, and some of those you guys probably know. Um, some of the demographics through history. What would be some characteristics of somebody who'd be likely to be arrested for any time in American history in the, in the 20th century? Just you can just yell it out. Drunk people. Drunk people. Yeah, yeah. That actually, that's. It's almost like you already read my lecture and you're up on the next section because we're going to talk all about drunk people. Um, but like, what about you know other like demographic characteristics? What kinds of people are most likely to be arrested demographically? Hmm? Poor, yeah, we're going to have poor people minorities. and all people, minorities, and that is going to change, you know, whether from immigrants, like we're talking about up here, um, to African Americans um, being the most uh, over policed group and in and, and other areas, right, Mexican Americans, um, excuse me? Young boys, yep, uh, particularly, um, oh, you should put up your hand before, before. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job with calling, um, or like running, um, but uh, yeah, so uh, people who are uh, teenagers, right? You know, we, we talk about some of that, um, and also the most obvious one. I'm just saying, I think it's most obvious. Men, right? Men, men are by far uh, men and boys right, are by far the most likely population uh, to be arrested, and that doesn't change over time. So just to give you some numbers on that, uh, one of the most uh, consistent features of people who are arrested through the progressive era to the present is that they're going to be male. Um, 90% pretty much, uh, almost at any time, you don't get too far from 90% mark of the, the people who are arrested are going to be male. Okay, you can, uh, Female arrests can get a little bit higher than 10%, um, but generally speaking, you have 10% in 1897, you have 10% in, uh, in 1989, um, these, these numbers are actually from Pittsburgh, but they're pretty representative um, of the entire uh, country. But it's a pretty steady number throughout uh, American history. 90% of arrests are going to be of um, men and boys. Okay. Age is going to jump around a little bit more than that, uh, which, as some people pointed out, you have uh, juveniles, uh, particularly uh, 16, 17-year-olds, right, are going to be very likely to be arrested at pretty much all times in history. Right? It's a very heavily uh, arrested uh, age group. Um, <clears throat> uh, arrest, uh, arrest rates for juveniles are going to skip around a little bit more than the really consistent gender arrest rates. Uh, in 1897, 20% of all arrests were of people 20 or younger. That's how they kept those numbers instead of cutting off 18, so a little bit different. Um, and uh, uh, 1956, um, again, you're going to have something like 20% of the people who are arrested are going to be, um, in this case, uh, under 18, right? Um, so you have, uh, and, and this fluctuates down to in the 1950s, they actually are arresting more like 8%, 8 to 8 to 8 to 8 to 9 percent, something like that, um, juveniles in the 1950s. 1952, they claimed only to have arrested 3.7 percent juveniles, right? So it does fluctuate as they develop different kinds of po policing policies to deal with juvenile populations, right? So that is one of the numbers that's going to change a little bit more, but generally speaking, uh, juveniles, uh, older juveniles, 16, 17, are going to be heavily policed and heavily arrested population. Um, after that, in almost all periods, you're going to have 20-year-olds and 30, uh, 20 to 30-year-olds and 30 to 40-year-olds are going to be very heavily represented among arrested people. Interestingly, um, there are some periods in which 35 and over is a majority of people arrested. But then when you break down, that's actually the 50s and 60s, when you break down those numbers, they're being arrested for, um, almost all of them are being arrested for vagrancy and drunkenness. Um, so they're kind of like, oh, we're going to clean up the streets. And they're particularly, in some periods, targeting uh, older men. Um, not the 35 is very old, but um, relatively, relatively older men. Um, OK. So basically, though, you're going to be a young or youngish male if you're arrested at any time. This isn't going to change uh, that much. One thing that does change is that after the war on drugs starts, you actually get a increase um, in the 80s and 90s on juvenile arrests, right? So you get up to somewhere near 25% um, of arrested juvenile arrests, and that's, that's new. 
Okay. Uh, <clears throat> minority status. If you're a member of a racial minority, you are always, um, often, uh, not, not always, but often particularly likely to be arrested. And that's why we have this slide up here, because it seems so, in some ways, uh, this article seems so familiar. This is actually an article which is making the case, it's from 1912 in Pittsburgh, and this is actually making the case that, well, immigrants actually are not that criminally inclined. People are misunderstanding. This is making the sort of uh, counterintuitive case at the time that actually immigrants aren't particularly likely to commit crime, um, that they're more likely to be arrested for uh, nuisance violations and things like that. Um, but the reason that they're making that case in there is that most people assume that uh, immigrants, and at this case, at this period, they're talking about Eastern and Southern European immigrants, are particularly criminally inclined. Um, the, uh, as you get black migration up from the South, during the tw early 20th century, and particularly up through World War I and into the 20s, that uh, the Eastern and Southern Europeans are going to be sort of merged into the, the general wave of whiteness, right? People stop recognizing them as a distinct group, and their place is going to be taken by uh, African American migrants, Southern migrants, who are seen as particularly criminal, particularly the ones who have recently come up from the South are seen as having brought some sort of in, uh, inherent uh, criminality with them. And they're going to be very likely uh, to be arrested. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in 1967, nationally, uh, African American arrests are about five times the rate of white arrests, okay? And that's going all the way back to 1967. Um, and that, that sort of over, we're, we're very familiar with that story of um, over-incarceration, but that's also true um, in terms of arrests. So, for instance, in Pittsburgh, in uh, 1989, 54% of arrests were of uh, non-white people. Okay, which is going to be in Pittsburgh, very largely African American, um, whereas they make up um, at that time, you know, something around one third of the population, right? So it's a, it's a very extreme form of uh, uh, overrepresentation among the arrested population, quite disproportionate. <clears throat> okay, another category, and some some that some of you guys brought up was economically marginal. And again, this is something which has a very long history. So in 1897, if you go look at the police records um, from Pittsburgh, their police annual reports from 1897, they do a very good job writing down all these characteristics of all the people that they have arrested that year. Um, and it's interesting to note that on the long list of people they arrested, 58% of the people they arrested gave their occupation as laborer, okay, as laborer. So 58% gave their occupation as labor. When you add in the other most frequent occupations, which are no occupation, uh, clerks, right? Um, and, and this is going to get a little more complicated. But the other really common one is housekeepers, right? That's because women are going to call themselves housekeepers, right? So that's basically all women. That's the 10% of women coming in, or almost not all women, but a lot of the women are going to be calling themselves uh, housekeepers. Um, but when you add in those categories, um, you're at something like 80% of all people who are arrested are from these very lowest um, uh, uh, populations, socioeconomic populations uh, in 1897. And again, that's something which really isn't going to change dramatically um, over time. Uh, there's obviously some exceptions, right? There's uh, all, you know, there's a list of hundreds of occupations in which people were arrested in Pittsburgh, right? Um, but uh, definitely the huge numbers are coming with the laborers, the clerks, um, no occupation. Uh, okay, in 1967, nationally, 24% uh, of everyone who was arrested was a laborer, right? At a time when only 5% of the population uh, was on the census as laborers, right? So again, that's going to be the very lowest uh, category, people who are sort of unskilled workers um, who are working with their, you know, using their, their, their strengths, you know, to make their day-to-day -day, uh, living without having a particular uh, training. Um, 
Okay, so that's going to be consistent over time. There's really uh, almost no variance in that. Um, so economically marginal. Um, Another important characteristic of people who are going to be arrested is that they're going to be members of a non, um, in many cases, members of a group that's deemed non-conforming or threatening, right? And that group could be a group with a political orientation, right? So it could be, for instance, there are a lot of periods in time which communists were very heavily over-policed, right, and subject to arrest. Um, uh, Communists, um, hippies. Right, uh, you know, if you want to go back into the 60s and 60s uh, and 70s, people who, uh, you know, dressed like hippies and were out there doing hippie things, um, were very likely to be arrested with their guitars, and you know, but they're, you know, you know, they're, uh, but they were very likely to be arrested, um, you know, at this time. Of uh, anarchists, right? People who identified as anarchists were often subject to um, subject to arrest. Uh, just or Black Panthers, right? We go later on. You know, they are being arrested in part because they're a member of a minority group, but they're going to be arrested at much greater rates than other members of the Black population because they're the member of this sort of adversarial group um, that's deemed uh, threatening or menacing. Um, gay Americans, right? Um, gay Americans who are uh, often seen, particularly. Um, you know, through much of the 20th century, uh, were widely seen as uh, uh, sort of a dangerous group of people, a sort of a danger to our nation, um, potentially subversive, right? Um, were uh, very, very heavily over-policed, um, very, very uh, likely to be arrested. Okay, so if you're arrested, you usually were a member of some of these different kinds of populations. And the thing is, and how this comes back to our question of how did you experience your arrest, is that not only were you a member of this population, but you also were well aware that these populations were over-policed and subject to, you know, uh, subject to disproportionate arrest. This is all over the newspapers. You know, there's nothing new to this realization that there's over-policing by race or, or by politics or anything like that. Newspapers were always well aware of it, and people complained about it constantly. So if you were a member of one of these groups and you were arrested, at the moment of your arrest, you would have carried that with you. You would have been aware that um, there was this broader context um, in which your arrest was taking place. And I assume that that would have shaped how you experienced um, your arrest. So we're going to go now to the second question, which is, why were you arrested? So what were people arrested for um, historically? And this is actually something that surprised me a little bit, though apparently it didn't surprise Tommy, um, because he, he, knew, he knew very well that the people who were arrested were almost all um, arrested for, uh, the vast majority of people arrested are actually arrested for um, order charges, right, rather than for, you know, public order problems such as drunkenness, right, rather than uh, criminal, uh, more formal criminal charges. Um, <clears throat> so the simple answer to that you might, if you hadn't thought about it too much, when you ask, well, what, what are people arrested for? What you might say is, well, they're arrested because they committed a crime, and when you commit a crime, you know, you are arrested for it. But actually, that doesn't take into account uh, a lot of things that stand between committing a crime and being arrested, right? And one of them is most people in all times in American history, most people who've committed crimes, violent crimes or property crimes have not been arrested, right? Um, We've never had a clearance rate uh, of crimes nationally in the United States that was anything like 50%, right? So when you commit a crime, um, even a a violent crime um, or a property crime, which even those crimes which are reported, which many crimes aren't, the clearance rate is always you know, 30%, you know, at best, right? 20%, you know, wherever you are, right? So when you do commit a crime, chances are that you're not going to be arrested for that particular crime, right? And that's even assuming, those clearance rates assume that the person who is ends up being assigned the crime was actually the person who did the crime, right? So assuming that sometimes that's not the case, that makes the clearance rate even lower, right? So for that reason, it can't be the case if you're a person who is arrested, even if you had committed a crime, you wouldn't see the arrest necessarily as a a necessary natural consequence of that crime. Because often, usually, um, when people commit that crime, in almost every case, they don't get arrested, right? So it's a little more complicated than saying, I did the crime, now I expect the arrest, 
you actually can't quite expect the arrest. Um, uh, so in uh, Pittsburgh in 1978, 33.5% uh, of cases were cleared. That was pretty good. Um, the FBI now says there's a 20.5% clearance rate. Oh, I'm sorry, in 2000, the FBI reported a 20.5% clearance rate nationally. Um, only 16.7% of property crimes are cleared, right? Um, there's actually, I was looking at the rates of clearance in the 1970s for car theft, and it made me want to go back into the 1970s and steal cars because it was like the rate of clearance was like 4% or 5% or something. I was like, nobody ever gets arrested for stealing a car in the city of Pittsburgh, right? It happened all the time, and they didn't ever seem to be able to, uh, to solve it. So that there was this kind of mushy relationship between... Um, being uh, committing a crime and and being arrested much more mushy than people uh, appreciate. Um, most arrests have actually been for things that we're least likely to think of as crimes, right? Um, or as when we think of crimes, the, the last things that tend to come up. Uh, the President's Crime Commission, however, noted in 1967, there was a big national study, and that's why I keep on uh, coming back to it. Um, but they noted in 1967, nearly 45% of all arrests are for crimes without victims or crimes against the public order. Okay. Um, and in 1982, uh, two scholars named uh, George uh, Kelling and James Q. Wilson had the very creative, innovative idea of broken windows policing, right? Which was basically, if you want to stop crime, you really need to arrest people for order violations, right? But the fact is, throughout the 20th century, that's absolutely been what the police have been doing. The police have been spending most of their time, most of their arresting time, most of their arresting energy, arresting people for order violations, Right? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and show you some numbers here. So when people are arrested, if you were arrested in the 19th century, it was, it's extremely likely that your arrest was for an order violation. Okay, so here is 1896 Pittsburgh. Who gets arrested for what? 1% okay. um, of people who get arrested in Pittsburgh in 1896 are arrested for uh, violent crimes. Um, uh, just like 2% are arrested for order crimes. Okay? You have 10% who are arrested for, and there's other, which I don't even know what that is. Um, you have 10% who are arrested for moral crimes. And this, uh, that would be, what would that be? M moral crimes at this time would be... Not even rape. I'm putting that in violent crimes. Yeah, it would be, uh, that would be moral crimes would be prostitution, uh, gambling... Um, and uh, uh, sodomy, right, you know, in 1896, yeah. Um, so it'd be like all sorts of, you know, any sort of sexual crime, victimless sort of sexual crime, or, uh, you know, gambling, um, kind of, you know, lewd behavior would fit into there. Um, oh, uh, adultery, um, uh, you know, any sort of, um, you know, sec a violation of the pretty rigid uh, sex codes um, of the day would have been a moral crime. That's 10 percent. But the rest of the crimes, almost 86 of the prison time, when, when the police officer claps handcuffs on somebody, they are clasping handcuffs on somebody for an order crime. That's going to be mainly drunkenness. Right? It's going to be drunkenness, um, or it's going to be uh, uh, disorderly behavior. Right? I went ahead and put assault, simple assault, in with violent crimes. Um, right? But actually, simple assault, quite you know, arguably, would also fit into an order crime, right? Um, so basically, the police are spending most of their time getting loud, rambunctious, uh, out of control, you know, people um, or vagrancy, right? Vagrancy is in that category. Um, people who don't seem to belong, right? And later on, I'm going to put when we get to later periods, I'm going to put drunken driving in that, uh, even though it's dangerous, right? Uh, it is so far, right, a victimless crime. Um, they're putting people who are violating the public order um, are mainly what they're policing. Okay, when you get up to 1956, you see the numbers are, have changed. Um, you actually have relatively more attention to, um, you know, kind of the, the bread and butter crimes, right? The crimes that we think of when we think of what the police are doing, arresting people for. Um, you actually have 11% of arrests are for property crimes. You have 5% of arrests are for violent crimes. 
Um, you still have this like other category, which I'm, I'm not quite sure how to um, how to process. And um, you have uh, moral crimes have actually shrunk a little bit during that period, though they're still substantial. 68% of your arrests are still going to be for your crimes against uh, the public order. And then if you go up one more click, uh, 1989, um, same city. Um, uh, you actually see it has changed pretty substantially, right? But you still have order crimes, the, uh, the lion's share of um, what people are being arrested for. That's decreased a little bit. Anybody want to have a theory on why that might have decreased? You guys, anybody want to anybody have a theory? Why might it have gone down? And this is, this is a theory, but I'm thinking, um, I think it's stop, stop and frisk. I think that uh, uh, policing got more broad Right around this time, in the ways in which they're going to be interacting with the population, right? So instead of arresting uh, somebody uh, if they're trying to interact with somebody on the street, right? Instead of arresting them for something like disorderly conduct, right, or vagrancy, which now they're not allowed to arrest them for um, because of some laws that are passed in the 60s and 70s, um, instead of that, they're actually going to be stopping and frisking and having that sort of interaction on the street, right? So that's one way that that changes. <clears throat> okay. So um, the vast bulk of these arrests um, are going to be are going to involve officer discretion, right? Order crime arrests are arrests that an officer isn't given a, a warrant for, right? An officer observes something on the street which appears to him to be disorder, him or her um, in the later periods, right? To be a disorderly uh, thing. And that officer is going to uh, decide that keeping the peace or keeping the public order demands uh, removing that person from uh, society. But that's very much about officer discretion. That said, if officers had a discretion that was very different than what the people who are paying them wanted, right, they would have to, you know, shift over time, right? So this is a pretty steady process. You know, officer, you know, police everywhere are doing this, you know, pretty consistently over the entire century, right? So we can't, you know, we have to imagine that uh, this is what the public are looking for, you know, in their policing, right? The officer has some choice in who they're going to arrest, um, but presumably who they arrest for these these order crimes is going to reflect what the people who are paying them want for them to be doing, right? Um, rather than just, you know, a whole bunch of rogue officers all the time, right? Um, okay. <clears throat> so what that, what that might do with how you would feel about being arrested is it might make you feel like... Uh, there was a real disjuncture between anything that you might have done and the fact that you were being arrested, right? That there was there, that would that wouldn't be such a simple relationship to you um, even at the time because you would be aware um, that there was a lot of discretion going on and a lot of slippage, right, between doing a thing and being arrested for a thing, right? <clears throat> Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about some of the technicalities. We'll talk about how were people arrested. Um, what did the arrest, when we try to get at what would arrest would feel like, we have to start thinking about what did, um, what kind of technology was brought to bear, um, you know, what, uh, how, did, how did the officer uh, behave, what kind of rules were they following. Um, and of course, from the very beginning of this period, the progressive era, uh, many officers uh, were armed with... Uh, Revolvers, right? Um, with uh, what they call police revolvers, um, or um, automatic. Later on, you're going to get up to uh, uh, Colts and Smith and, Wes Wes uh, Smith and Wes Wessons, like in this 1960 catalog. Um, but officers were not required in the progressive era in many, it's going to vary from place to place, but they're not required to have sidearms. Um, sometimes they have only their police batons, right? And they often use their police batons. Police batons are a really important part of how they're going to try to control people, right? Um, but um, officers are allowed through this period to have uh, sidearms. There actually were, were debates back in the uh, middle of the 19th century about whether police should be allowed to have sidearms, 
Um, and uh, there was actually some really, I almost included it here, but it was going back too far. But some people were like, you know, we don't trust the police. If they had, you know, if they had, uh, you know, what would they do? You know, who would they be shooting at? Like, none of us would be safe. So there's like, in these sort of major newspapers, there was this kind of question about how carefully are we selecting our police right in the mid 19th century when it was largely a political you know, a patronage position and whether they should be armed. But by the progressive era and all the way through the 20th century, police had the right to carry arms and uh, often were required to carry arms in addition to their uh, nightsticks. So they're going to be armed. Um, and there is going to be a steady complaint in newspapers in all periods right, about uh, the potential of some officers using police brutality. So police brutality, if you go back and search through the newspapers, it's not something that people start complaining about in the 1960s and 1970s. It's something people are complaining about all the way through, you know, constantly, all the way through the 20th century. It's a, a staple of newspaper articles, right? Um, I have a, a quotation here from... Um, a letter to the editor, um, and I found it, uh, it was written by a retired police officer. It's in the early 1970s, and I thought it was really interesting because it's written by a retired police officer, and the, w the place I found it was in the Pittsburgh Police History Archives, which means that the police uh, historians decided to keep it. Uh, the people who are themselves retired police who have a little group that, you know, saves up things, you know, they decided to keep this letter. So it had a certain endorsement, I think, you know, from policemen. And what this letter said was it was responding to the charge that police brutality uh, in the 70s was often brought against African-Americans, right? And it says, among so many police officers of many races and national origins, there are some who are hot-tempered, bad-mannered, or even brutal, but let me say from experience that the victims of their volatile temperaments when aroused were white as well as colored, right? So there was like a general understanding, you know, that people, everybody would, you know, admit to, right, that there was sometimes a problem uh, and sometimes a very serious problem with police brutality. So when you're arrested, you would also be aware of that potential. And this is disturbing, but I'm going to share it anyway. Um, you know... But basically, if you go and look through, as, as I did, look through a newspaper database. I looked through the newspapers.com database, um, and uh, you know, which has a lot of 19th century uh, and, and through the 20th century newspapers up to up to the present. But I just sir, I just did a, a keyword search at first for uh, the phrase after I came across it several times uh, for the phrase "Negro killed resisting arrest." Right? Negro killed resisting arrest. I searched that phrase, and I got 98,699 hits. Okay? And now, that doesn't necessarily mean there's problems with searches, and sometimes the words are a little bit off and things like that, right? And uh, they're, you know, so you know, take it for what it's worth. But I had to sit down for a minute and kind of think about that, right? Um, and they weren't particularly clustered. And also, the word Negro right, isn't going to be used in the newspaper after... Right, you know, up into the certainly not by the 1980s. Nobody's been using it in a newspaper, so. But it's just huge amounts of uh, uh, you know people, uh, black people killed resisting arrest. Now all people killed resisting arrest were not black, and actually threw up some extra um, some of those things up here, uh, you know, which were uh, white people who were killed resisting arrest, or in this case, a Mexican person who was killed resisting arrest. Right, but there was always this potential um, when you're arrested uh, for violence and for uh, lethal violence, particularly that you had to um, had to be aware of. Okay. How would they transport you? Okay, part of arresting you is getting you getting you in those cuffs, right? But part of arresting you is getting you back to the station, right, where you can be put in a jail cell. Okay, this is, um, this is something which actually did change substantially over time and changed what it meant to be policed, right? Um, and uh, one thing that happened was that in, uh, the, the, at the very first uh, part of the period we're talking about, during the progressive era, police officers were mainly on foot. Okay, um, they were mainly on foot, and so if they arrested someone, they would actually have to spend the rest of their shift walking them back to the police station, right? If they would walk with them, 
um, walking them back to the police station, right, and getting them booked in and getting back, and their whole beat would be unpoliced, right, during the time that they were going on that long, uh, that long trek. It was even worse if people would not agree to go with them, you know, and walk along with them on that. And they would have to do things like carry, or they would do things like carry people they had rested in wheelbarrows, right? Um, <clears throat> eventually, around uh, close to the beginning of the period we're talking about, uh, around 1890, most uh, major municipalities acquired patrol wagons. So that meant that if they could get word, you know, back to the station, they could send out the station's patrol wagon to come out and pick up the person they'd arrested and, like, bring them. But again, it's a long period of time, and that police officer has to keep the person subdued, like, during that period of time. There's just a lot of wiggle room in there for things to happen uh, during the arrest. Okay, so it becomes actually, it's actually very hard, and, pl and police officers can't communicate with each other, right? They can't call to each other for help. <laughs> So, um, so during the arrest, if they need backup or something, there is no backup, right? You have to call it to community members, um, you know, to, to back you up if they're willing to do that um, during this early period. Now, they also start getting call boxes, right, which are stationary call boxes. They also get that um, uh, around, yeah, around 1890. They start acquiring call boxes that can uh, uh, communicate back to the station, which makes that... Uh, that process easier, but it's still a long wait. Um, it's not until the 1930s that they start getting uh, cars, um, and these cars around that same time are equipped with police radios, okay, and that makes it a lot easier for them to actually uh, arrest people and quickly uh, uh, subdue them, put them into a car, and bring them back to the station. However, police radios and cars are expensive, so some municipalities actually don't even get them until the 1950s. Right. So for a long time, uh, you know, up to the middle of the century, it's actually very difficult sometimes to arrest uh, people. Um, <clears throat> were people, when you're arrested, likely to give you uh, respect, treat you with respect? Um, you know, we don't, again, we have limited uh, information about that. But I do have one thing that really struck me, which is when I was looking back through the Police History Association records in 1968, uh, the commander of the Pittsburgh police issued a, uh, a statement uh, on courtesy um, that he circulated to the officers about how you have to treat people in the general public. And in the statement of, uh, uh, he says, members of the police bureau shall treat, shall treat the public, their associates and superior officers with respect and courtesy. They shall be quiet, civil and orderly at all times. They shall avoid the use of profane or abusive language. They shall control their tempers and exercise discretion in the performance of their duties. They must use ma'am or sir if the names are not known and Mr. or Mrs. if surnames are known. They are never allowed to call somebody kid or boy. Um, and then there's a list of words that they cannot use. It's a list of uh, 10 or 12 words that I will not share with you right now, right? But, um, but it's not really it's words that I had to look up and figure out, actually, in some cases. Um, but, uh, but, you know, they're actually saying, in 1968, you guys have to stop, you know, using some of this really abusive language that tells you a lot about what happened, right, before um, they tried to institute those reforms in 1968. Um, okay, uh, did you have rights? Right after 1966, you're going to be read your Miranda rights. Right, and that's going to be one huge change in the sort of architecture, the structure of the arrests. Okay. Coming now to the, oh, I'm going to show you now. Sorry, I didn't show you the different modes of uh, arrest, but here we have an, an early uh, kind of on-foot arrest of a tramp with, with a police dog, which I have all the way through. Um, here they're arresting a striker. I didn't talk about horses, but they did use horses um, through, well, they still do, right? Um, but, uh, but they were available, obviously, before you had the cars. Um, not so much to transport people, but to suppress, um, to arrest people. Um, and then here is a sort of early uh, patrol car. It's actually a state highway patrol car, but you get the idea. Um, and here is a police officer talking into his police radio. Very iconic. Okay. What control did people have during their arrest? What could you have done if you were being, arrest, uh, being arrested during the 20th century? Um, there are a couple of ways that you could have exercised control, depending on who you were and what your situation was, um, during your arrest. Um, first of all, and this is going to be particularly true in this earlier part of the century, right, um, that you have control by your 
uh, the importance of your cooperating, right? If it's really hard to arrest you and really hard to get you to the station, they really value your willingness to be willing to walk, right, with them instead. And I have a, a 1901 newspaper story, which is kind of funny, um, about a guy who's being arrested in 1901. Uh, Harry Baldwin of Media, Pennsylvania, kicked out of, was kicked out of a music venue for disorderly conduct. Two officers undertook to take him to the police headquarters. Baldwin, however, had decided objections and announced that he would die first. Baldwin fought desperately, grabbing both antagonists and falling with them. Every hitching post and telegraph pole was a friend to him as he clung to them tenaciously. The officers finally became exhausted and had to hold him down and to help arrive. Ultimately, six men were necessary to carry him to the police station, giving him the frog march, which was carrying him upside down with like holding on to his limbs and carrying him upside down. That's from 1901. So you had some control by your willingness to acquiesce to arrest. So for instance, when you read about arrest during this period, People will say things like, okay, you can arrest me, but I have to go tell my mom I'm being arrested. She's over at the next house. Or like, I have to go upstairs and trade coats with my friend so I have the coat that I want when I'm arrested, right? You know, things like that. So you actually had a little bit of wiggle room because your compliance was so important to them uh, from a practical viewpoint. You also had people say, you can't arrest me. You're going to have to go get more people. Right? There's, there's newspaper stories like that who are just like, I'm sorry, you're just one guy, and I don't think you can do it. Um, and so uh, there was a lot more with police not so able to communicate with each other. There was a lot more of that kind of uh, objection. Um, okay. What other kind of control could you exert? Um, one thing that you had was that a lot of people throughout this period were skeptical of police techniques in arresting and are, were sort of skeptical of the police arrest. And so you actually frequently, and this is going to be, again, from the very beginning of this period um, to, uh, to its end, you're going to have a lot of community resistance to arrests. And particularly where police are not so connected with one another, um, that can be decisive. There's an 1888 newspaper article from uh, Monongahela, um, Pennsylvania. It says, quote, the way to look at it and the, um, the way to look at it and the lesson to learn from it is that people who offend must expect to suffer. It's a common thing to resist arrest and to laugh at constables, but public sentiment must be turned the other way. So here he's this newspaper sort of chastising people to stop just laughing at the police officers and trying to help people who are being arrested, right? So one thing you had in your corner if you were being arrested is that you could try to mobilize uh, people around you, um, particularly in these earlier periods. You try to mobilize people around you to help you to resist arrest. That's a common thing to happen. And this is also something that doesn't happen as soon as I would have expected. Now, you guys just read... Uh, uh, John Edgar Wideman's book, right? And in that book, one of the, the scenes that I find most powerful, um, he, his book, Brothers and Keepers, um, is that is written by his brother, uh, Robbie um, uh, Farouk, Robert Wideman. And he says, quote, in the summer of 68, we fought the cops in the streets. I mean, sure enough, punch out fighting like in those Wild West movies and do. Everyone in Homewood, um, up on Homewood Avenue, uh, which is a African American neighborhood in um, Pittsburgh, was duking with the cops. Funny thing was, it was just fighting. There wasn't no shooting or nothing like that. Somebody must have put the word out from downtown. You can whip their heads, but don't be shooting any of them, right? Um, and so you actually had, and, and I started to, see, I was trying to figure out how un, unusual that was. That, and you know, he's making this claim that the the police were sort of constantly fighting with people in the community. So I was looking through newspapers. Every couple weeks in the Pittsburgh newspapers, they have a story of what they call, the, the term you have to search for is the melee, a search for a melee. So every couple weeks, somebody is being arrested, and community members come out, like, fight with the police to, you know, to object to their being arrested. People are throwing bottles at police cars, you know, people throw rocks at police cars. Um, and, and this is the melee, right, is, is a sort of common thing. Um, and so when you're arrested, you can also be charged with um, you know, uh, uh, incitement, 
right? Um, and so if you are incitement to riot, it's a very common charge, right? And so if you're arrested, if you try to incite people around you to riot, um, that is an additional charge for you as well. But it's a, it's a frequently used additional charge because it was a very, very common, uh, common thing to do, particularly in the black communities and particularly among uh, war protesters, right, who are also being very heavily policed and um, gay populations who are also being very heavily policed, right? So a whole bunch of different you know, groups would try to rally people um, around them, right, in order to, uh, to resist. Um, arrest. So you had that kind of... You had potentially that kind of uh, uh, option um, if you wanted to uh, resist. Um, you could also evoke your allies on the outside. Um, so, for instance, if you're being arrested, uh, you could call on, you frequently did, um, you know, call on people to help you out um, and demand that the police give you uh, good treatment because they know that you can call on these allies. So for instance, the best example of that, we were just talking about this earlier, but wealthy people who are being arrested, right? The police understand that they would have, um, that many of them have wealthy associates. So when they're being arrested, they might be treated differently because the police are concerned about how these wealthy associates uh, or supporters might um, be able to sort of push back at the conditions of that arrest. Uh, If you weren't wealthy, um, you know, if you were an African American um, and uh, you know could call in the NAACP, right? Who is always you know fighting this, or you know various kinds of groups. If you were a member of a labor union early in the century, right? You could call in your labor union, and so you could make that claim during the arrest that you have support. Right, that that you can't treat you like this, right? Um, because you're going to have this sort of external support um, to to push back against it. So you had a certain amount of, depending on who you were, you might have a certain amount of uh, discretion in the arrest. And that brings us to the last part of the last question, which is the one I really care about and the one that the other questions are just sort of meant to feed into. Right, um, And it's also the question that we are going to fail to answer. Um, but we're going to start taking a stab at answering it because I think it's really, really important. Um, and that is, how did people feel about being arrested? What was it like at that moment that you were arrested? And I talked about, at the beginning, about how hard it was to get at this question because people don't like to answer it, right? And also because people often don't care to ask it um, and don't care to record it and don't care to keep it um, where it has been recorded. Um, but, but what I want to do is uh, think about what it feels like to be arrested now and now-ish, right? Um, and I want to try to triangulate that and sort of push that back into these historical arrests to uh, imagine how it might have been similar to and different from these historical arrests, given the structural differences and similarities that we've been talking about. Um, I asked you guys, um, and I also did a couple of interviews um, about I did a couple of interviews of people who were arrested in the 1970s and asked them how it felt to be arrested, right? Um, and I also asked you guys uh, to to write down, you know, how it felt to be arrested. And I've been looking at some of those, and I want to read off some of those answers now, or uh, tell you about some of the the answers that I got from uh, my interviews to kind of start thinking about some of the ways it might feel. Uh, to be arrested because there's a real diversity of experience and maybe that's the first thing and that's the first thing that many of you guys said in your response kind of it depends right it depends are you being arrested for drunkenness that might feel really different right than being arrested for a more serious charge right it might feel even trivial right it might feel it might not affect you very much and I told you the story last week <clears throat> of uh, the guy who I came across who I was so sort of entertained by, I guess, um, though it wasn't entertaining because it was a police brutality story, right? But it was, I, I was entertained by his behavior, which was when he was arrested, uh, he asked the police to please cuff his hands in the f- so we could finish eating his slice of pizza, 
right? And that was not something that went down with the police and ended up being a story about police brutality, right? But uh, that revealed that at least when this person was arrested uh, in Oakland, right, uh, probably a hippie, right, um, you know, that he was not impressed um, by uh, the scene. He was not horrified, you know, by the scene of his being arrested. And he was, he was game for engaging further, right, with the police at that moment. Um, <clears throat> so... So it really depends on why you're being arrested. Is it for something serious? Is it for being casual? For something casual? Uh, somebody else wrote in a response. Um, it depends on whether you're being arrested for something you did or something you didn't do, right? Um, you know, if you're being arrested for something you did, you wonder what the penalty is going to be like or what's likely to happen. If you're being arrested for something you didn't do, you wonder what's going on, right? And, uh, you know, how quickly you're going to be able to get out of it. So, you know, so it, uh, you know, the, the circumstance of arrest is really going to change dramatically. Also, who you are when you're arrested is going to really change how you respond. Um, somebody said in their comment that actually... <clears throat> Being a person who was uh, fairly uh, prosperous and respectable before being arrested in some ways could backfire on you because then people are so, uh, the police officer is so horrified, you know, or seems to be particularly offended by your, uh, your crime in relationship to your status, you know, that actually it kind of seems like maybe even a fake all along or like, you know, um, how have you betrayed, you know, your class position. I actually myself, the one arrest I've ever witnessed um, was of a, a white man um, in Chicago. It was in uh, the 1990s. And when he was arrested, I've told you guys a longer version of that, but when he was arrested by two white police officers, one thing they said to him was, uh, you know, you are, you are an embarrassment to your race. So, you know, the fact that he was white uh, to these racist police officers, you know, was particularly, uh, you know, offensive to them, you know, that, that he wouldn't uh, be sober um, in that case. Okay. Uh, but so, so there's a whole bunch of different ways in which you can be arrested, a whole bunch of different circumstances. But I want to read some of these answers. Um, some, a lot of people said, uh, when you are arrested, one thing you feel is confusion, Right. Uh, confusion. Now, that could be related to substance abuse, right? Um, a lot of people, when they're arrested, perhaps have some substances in their system, right? And so when you're arrested, you may well not be entirely uh, coherent and aware of what's going on around you. Um, but even if you're completely uh, clear of substances, you might still uh, be very confused about what's going on, uh, particularly if, uh, you know, you're not guilty of that charge, right? Or, uh, you know, you... you you don't believe that you're guilty of that charge, that can, that can come as, as a great shock. Um, somebody said, it doesn't register what's going on at first, right? Um, or if there's a huge time period that passes between the time you might have committed that crime and the time you're arrested. Um, I was talking to a guy who was arrested um, after a year you know, a year after his crime. And he was, he thought nobody was even looking for him anymore, right? And then all of a sudden, here's the police. And it was really like, it was like this interruption of this other life that he had been building. It seemed to come out of nowhere, right? So I think that there's just sort of a lot of, there can be a lot of confusion. Um, somebody else said, when it's your first time being arrested, it's easy to be intimidated by the process and especially by the unknown. It's important to keep your cool. Um, other people describe the process of getting arrested as a disempowering. I have a quote, a helpless feeling as if you have no power or control over your person. Demoralizing, like being caught doing something your mom told you not to do and being caught red-handed. The shame, guilt, and embarrassment is overwhelming. Another one said, and I felt like this was a statement, disempowering kind of statement too, the world shrinks before you. And your future is instantly changed the moment you are thrown in handcuffs. All your free will and rights are gone. There's another set of rules that apply. Plus, you're about to find out real fast who's there for you. Right? So being arrested and being sort of pulled out of the community makes you realize like who, who's going to still be there for you when they try to pull you out of the community. What part of the community is going to cling? Right? Um, uh, other people, um, uh, another quote that I thought was uh, 
powerful was somebody who was arrested as a teenager who said being arrested was very scary, humiliating, embarrassing, and demoralizing. The, uh, the whole and somebody else, the whole act of arresting is humiliating, of being, arrest, being arrested is humiliating, whether you deserve it or not. People are looking at the spectacle, assuming the worst, gasping, shaking their heads, judging you, some even recording, which could lead to your arrest becoming viral. Um, the shame of that, uh, somebody said. It makes you numb, ashamed, dot, 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 but sometimes proud, right? And I think that that uh, is important because the person who's arrested is not necessarily going to be acknowledging the proper authority and moral righteousness of the person who's arresting them, right? They may feel like they have a different set of rules that they've been following and that the person who's arresting them uh, represents a different set of rules, a different set of values, right? Um, and, and therefore uh, being arrested or standing in against that um, might be something that would, that would make them proud in some way. Um, I have a couple more. Um, one, being arrested brought about two very distinct characteristics, fear and motion. Very few things in life, I'd ever, I, very few times in life had I ever known fear in such a tangible or physical way. So much so that the only way to keep fear from totally consuming we, me was to forcibly stay in motion. I must stand in this line. I must get naked and be inspected. I must continue to move. Do not let the fear swallow me up um, or um, and I want to talk about that fear because somebody else said and one that I'm, I think about now I've been thinking about steady since I uh, since I read it but um, remembering the night that he was arrested a laser passing over around his head a laser point a red passing around his head and realizing in retrospect later that that had been you know obviously a rifle sight um, you know, and, you know, that kind of terror that you have, that realization, you know, I think is what makes time sort of slow down, right? What I do in these moments might be the most important things that I ever do, and yet I'm totally constrained in what I'm able to do, right? So it's confusing. It's sort of terrifying. It's truly dangerous, right? Um, and uh, it's a sort of intense, intense feeling, which I'm now going to give one of my very favorites, which is <clears throat> now being arrested is like facing one of your biggest disappointments. It's like getting the lowest possible score after studying all semester. It's like throwing up vomit all over yourself in front of a girl you like. It's like, wait, it's like blacking out while awake. The other thing that arrest means is that you screwed up. Other people got away with it. Most people commit a crime, they're not arrested. Right? Even if you're arrested for something you've done, the sense of, arrest, of, of having been arrested has to make you feel like, like you have failed to take care of yourself, right? to, to, to take care of all the, the things that might happen, to anticipate um, the danger that, that you're in. Um, so so being un, I think being arrested can also make you feel uh, unlucky, right? uh, you know, mad at yourself, right? um, but also uh, you know, oppressed. Um, besieged, you know, like the police are unfairly targeting you, um, even if perhaps you have done the very crime for which you're being arrested. It can still, uh, I think, um, have that sort of feeling for people. Okay, um, so anyway, we'll need to work uh, together, and we'll do this, uh, this class, we'll do this in, in future classes, to gather these sorts of insights from people um, who were arrested in the last 50 years and triangulate them with what we know about the structures and conditions of arrests in earlier periods to try to recover an arrestee's history of the arrest. We have to do this, um, both because it's important to recover the history for its own sake, because these people's lives matter and their experiences matter, and we have to know if we want to understand our nation's history, we can't just skip that important, important part of it. Um, but we also have to know, because it tells us a whole lot about what America has been and is, um, what must we do to stay within the law? And what happens to us if we stray outside of it? What and who do we see as a threat to order? And what does that say about our idea of order and our, our identity as a community? Um, so 
that said, I would love to um, have a discussion about this. If people have questions or thoughts, anything, I guess, comments, questions, but what you should do is put your hand up and then uh, they will move the uh, microphone uh, to you. Um, so I was really interested in how you were mentioning clearance rates, and I was wondering if there's anything in particular that you're aware of that goes into kind of determining who gets off free, like the percentages of how do we figure out, like, you know, mm -hmm. robbing cars in Pittsburgh in the 70s, like, how do they find those statistics if you're aware? Well, you know, you can't know. Part of the problem is um, you can't know who doesn't get caught. You can only know who does get caught. Right? It would be fascinating yeah. to have the list of like people who stole cars who didn't get caught and compare the list who did get caught and you could get you know, but obviously that's exactly what you can't have. Um, so that's part of it. I mean the only kind of interesting thing about clearance rates is that clearance rates are much higher for violent crimes, right, than for property crimes because people can usually identify um, a person who is a a uh, suspect in that. Um, that's why car thefts were so, so difficult um, to track down. I think they've actually gotten a lot better with recent technology, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it would be fascinating to be able to know who, get, who gets caught and who doesn't. But to do that, you'd have to have like a separate system of deciding who did, you know, <laughs> who actually did the crime, which we unfortunately don't have the capacity to have. Questions? Are there questions? Comments? Yes. Tommy. What do you think are the differences between a wealthy family reacting to a family member being arrested versus a poor communities reacting to their family member being arrested? Yeah. Going further as far as, like he said in Pittsburgh, in the, in the book we was reading, they were, people were fighting, they were when the police come. How do you think that the response would be in wealthier communities versus reaction of the poor communities when a family member or a friend is arrested? I really think it's very, that's a good question, right? I think it's very different because I think that at least um, from my familiarity, I think what happens is that uh, in a poor community um, and a community which traditionally has high arrest rates, right, um, that family members uh, anticipate the possibility of an arrest and it's not as shameful they also uh, are very ready to believe that there has been some injustice in the fact that their loved one has been arrested right so I think that if you're a person who's arrested and you have other family members who've been arrested you have neighbors who've been arrested um, you know you're in a situation in which arrest is, uh, is relatively normalized in your community you actually end up getting some really good family support um, whereas if you're in a uh, another kind of community where uh, they see themselves as inside the law and uh, I think often you're ostracized from your community you get much more cut off I mean I'd actually like to hear more from people, but at least in my, my relatively limited experience, that's what I'd say, that actually in some senses, the, the more prosperous you are, if you do end up in prison, right, um, uh, which you may not, right, but uh, if you do end up in prison, the more, uh, you, you know, the more prosperous you are, the less empathetic uh, your, your family is likely to be with, uh, uh, with your situation on some level. So, yeah, Andre. <coughs> Um, as far as your question about how do people feel about being arrested, I think in your initial arrest, the very first time you ever arrested, if you ever get involved with, have an issue with police, you don't know what the process is. So you're, you're unlearned, you don't know. So you don't know what to expect. But then if you're arrested again, maybe you've committed a crime and you know what the process is, you may know your circumstances about what your parameters are based on where you're from and where you're at. You know, the suburbs are not like the inner city. The rural areas are not like the inner city or the suburb. So knowing what's expected as far as the temperament of law enforcement is the issue. <clears throat> so you know how it's going to affect you. You know, if in my neighborhood, you make sure your hands are visible. And you, uh, you basically 
comply with whatever said. Otherwise, it could be detrimental. But if you were caught somewhere else, you might not know how to navigate that system. Yeah, because it, it varies so much. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. You, you had uh, mentioned about increased arrest rates for like incoming populations into a general area like migrants, Im I mean like immigrants and minorities. And then uh, look at those people versus people in poverty. They have higher arrest rates as well. Do you feel like those things kind of go hand in hand because most immigrants are more poverty stricken and, and most minorities are more poverty stricken? Or does one factor outweigh the other? Yeah, I think they're both important. Um, and I think that, uh, but it's definitely the case that if you are, say, a member of a minority group um, and you manage to not be impoverished, right? Um, you know, if you, 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 you're economically successful, um, uh, you're still very likely, police can't necessarily detect that when they see you on the street, right? So you might not be able to be marked um, in that way. So I think in, in part it may be that everybody who is, say, uh, you know, black or, um, you know, who is Hungarian or whatever is sort of marked on the street as poor and maybe that's what's being picked up, right? It's possible. Um, but yeah, it's true that those, those overlap. But it's also true that a member of a minority group who's not themselves poor is also over-policed, right? You no, know, pro probably because, you know, and this is true you know, again, you know, kind of through time, but uh, probably because of the difficulty in identifying or racial prejudice, right? Yeah. I'm wondering if you can comment in your, during your research on, in terms, in the context of public demonstrations or even protests, what the effect of a public arrest would be throughout history or the role, for instance. We know that it may be a preventative measure to stop something from occurring, but maybe it actually incites a frenzy or stirs up more violence. Yeah, and that definitely is something uh, that has been interesting to me looking through the Pittsburgh police records is in the 1960s and the early 70s, the late 1960s, or basically after 1966, right? Pittsburgh gets really uh, serious about training officers for dealing with demonstrations, right? And one thing that they do is that they sit there and map out, you know, we, we're all aware of this, is gonna surprise anyone, <clears throat> but they sit there and sort of map out how is it that you can effectively police a demonstration? It's very different than you know policing other areas, right? Because the people are in solidarity with each other, right? And they're more heavily, uh, you know, they're 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 in higher density. Um, but so they actually have uh, strategies that they start to develop about you know how to you know uh, move in a wedge, you know, and, and things like that. Those are things we're familiar with today, and they've refined them further in the last couple decades. But you can see that kind of technique and that sort of mapping um, being done even uh, as early as 67 and 68 in Pittsburgh. I assume it's happening all over the country. Yeah. Cool. Do you have any more? I had a question about, uh, what did you call it? What did you call the police? It was like almost like targeting a certain stop, demographic. Stop and frisk. No. Oh, stop and frisk, yeah. No? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what you just said. Uh, somebody, when he was talking Over-policing? Over-policing. Yeah. Why is it that you think that they over-police the poverty people rather than over-policing like the suburbs? And do you think that that relates to the amount of people, because me personally, I do. I feel like it relates to how much the minorities are arrested versus the rich. When the rich may be committing the same crimes that we are committing, but we are the ones that get pulled over, and we are the ones that's getting stopped and frisked. When they did the same things in the, the, the more upstanding communities, they may find the same things going on. Yeah, well, so I think part of it is that, and, and you have simultaneous also, simultaneous over-policing and under-policing, right? Because on the one hand, much more likely to be arrested, particularly on an order charge, right? Walking through the streets, right, of your neighborhood or on a drug charge now, right? Um, but, uh, but at the same time, um, 
you know, we did this little survey, you know, here in class, you know, and talking about how many people have been victims of crimes. Um, and I bet I couldn't tell which surveys were from people who are incarcerated, which surveys were from people who were, uh, you know, traditional Kent State students. Um, but uh, it did seem like there was an awful lot of victim, a lot of people who have suffered a lot of crime, you know, <laughs> sitting in, in this very class, right? So on the one hand, there's uh, over policing, they're very likely to arrest you. On the other hand, there's under policing in that they're less likely to arrest somebody who might have committed a crime um, against you. Now, why does that happen? Um, I mean, that's the you know that's the five million dollar question, right? Um, but uh, you know, I personally think that uh, it's it's a, a larger structural um, issue rather than something that we want to lay at the door of the specific officers usually. It's a question of what orders they're given. It's a question of what the expectations their superiors have for them when they put them there. It's a question of how many people they assign to those areas and how well resourced they are, right? I assume that they get the message over time, you know, that you're not rewarded so much for doing this kind of work in this area. Right, um, you're expected. I know now they often have quotas. They have to fill those quotas. Might be different, different kinds of arrests that you have to do on your, you know, during your uh, day's work. Right, and that depending on where you are. I know, like in New York City, I was just hearing a story. Depending on where you are in New York City, um, you might get a very different kind of quota of how many people you're expected to pick up during your shift. Right, so it's uh, you know almost producing the crimes before the crimes are committed. You can, you can decide. <laughs> like, I can't decide. <laughs> um, would you say that once the Smith & Wesson sidearm was introduced into the police force that the um, increase of killings and resisting arrests was increased immediately, or would it be shortly thereafter? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and, I mean, plenty of people died by being hit in the head with... Uh, police sticks, right? Um, you know, so it wasn't like that was not a, <laughs> that was not a fatality free kind of situation. Um, I, you know, uh, and I wish that I could answer that question. We even today don't have good numbers, right, for deaths in uh, police shootings, right? So it's, we certainly don't have good historical numbers for it. Um, it would be great to do that project. That would be a huge project. Um, but I think it could actually be sort of approximated. We could get some of those answers. Um, but I, I I don't have them, so I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a good question, though. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I feel like if you want to find out how people feel when it's what it's like to be arrested, you it's not something that happens it's just for a moment. That's just what it shows on camera, like, and everybody's kind of drawn into that. So that's what you might be kind of getting sucked into, looking in, targeting that moment. Just the cameras, lights everywhere flashing. You going to the back of the car, the newspapers. But it's about what that person feels in that moment. And then being arrested, it isn't really over until you're actually out of prison or out of jail. So, like, I guess my question to you is, how would you feel if they came in that door right now and arrested you and then told you you had life? What would you do, you know, like, and how would you feel in, like, that journey? through those moments of your emotions, that's, that's how you find out the answer. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think, if I can say the reason I was focusing on this moment, why I took that approach of the moment, and I, I think you're right, um, uh, is that I'm interested in that sort of like, that specific interaction. I'm interested in, I want the journey of like what happens inside your, but I'm also interested in like, how is that, like oh, that scene of the arrest, like that very moment, the power that's exchanged, you know, what, what happens, you know, sort of dramatically between these two people when one of them reaches out and says, you're not, you can't stay here in this community now. We're going to, you know, take you away. What is that sort of human moment between the two of them is ultimately one thing I would like to understand, as well as understanding the long-term outcome and the outcomes to families and communities as well. But thank you. Yeah. Andre. Uh, normally in policing systems, there's a red district. That's how 
the cause and effect happen and the temperament of the law enforcement changes. Okay, so inner city, more crime. It's just, that's just the fact. You know, you got everything going on in the city. Whereas <clears throat> those things don't happen out. But I think really about how it feels about being arrested, I think Stu, he hit it on the head. You know, unless you actually been arrested, you don't know exactly what it feels like. So you have to go through the motions, and I don't really, I'm sure you don't want to be arrested. I, I don't care to absolutely, be arrested. I'm, absolutely, I'm more <laughs> certain than ever. If I ever had thought maybe it wouldn't be so bad, I've changed my mind. Right. Yeah. So, so the speculation about it is always intriguing, but no one really wants to feel the feeling. Yeah. Okay, but when you really do, it's really, it's really straining on the, the body and the emotions. You know, as you think about your family, you think about what's going through, you know, that person's head that's about to arrest you, you know, what the family's going to do when you're arrested, when you're not in the home to take care of business. So a lot of things happen. So, I mean, you feel in the range of emotions, you know, and it's not really chaos or confusion for me based on me being arrested prior to. So, I mean, I'm aware of the situation, but... I don't understand the, the unintended consequences that could occur if I don't com comply or things get out of control. Yeah, no, that's right. Kind of a practical, like the practical consequences of arrest are super important, even if you're not traumatized by the drama of the moment or the, 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 the terror of the moment. Yeah, no, that's right. I think we have time for uh, one more. One more. And uh, uh, how about two more? How, we'll, do two, <laughs> we'll do two more. And we'll do Tommy and... and uh, Nick. Yeah. Do you believe the part of women's numbers being so slow being incarcerated is because they're smarter at committing crimes than men or the <laughs> traditional role they played in society back in that point, being housekeepers or the homebody woman? I think there's a bunch of answers to that, actually. Um, I do think women uh, tend to be less uh, violent. Um, less physically violent um, than men. That's just uh, we can we can we can disagree about that. But like, um, but I do think that women also uh, historically were much more likely to be in the home in pri private spaces. And so, for instance, like women for a long time didn't weren't likely to be seen as problem drinkers, right? Because they were drinking inside the home, so nobody was going to arrest them for. Uh, public drinking, right? They could be drinking an awful lot, but they're drinking inside the home, and so they're not going to come to the attention of the police. And I think that's probably true, actually, even today, you know, that uh, that women may be more likely to uh, be off the streets and sort of, uh, you know, in private spaces than men. Um, uh, that's just, it's a, a speculation I have, but I think it's a combination of a whole bunch of things, and it's a prejudice that you don't want to arrest a woman because she seems less, maybe she seems less threatening, even if she, perhaps she is uh, very fierce, you know, but she might she might appear to you to be less threatening um, because of your preconceptions about about women and men. And women are smaller in size, uh, generally speaking, um, you know, and so they might seem less uh, menacing for that reason as well, right? So, yeah. Okay, one more, and that's uh, Nick. Oh, here you go. Donna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. You're not Nick. I was just thinking, um, whenever you had the pie um, charts about um, different crimes, um, I like, whenever it got to, like, the 80s, I think, yeah. more violent crimes started to become, like, on the radar, I guess. Yes. Um, do you think that's whenever America's obsession with, like, serial killers starts to, like, blossom? Or, you know, like, people start getting, like, I don't know, I don't want to say obsessed, but people start, like, um, yeah, fat, being fascinated with, like, people like Jeffrey Dahmer, like, Bundy, and people like that. Do you think that kind of, like, yeah. has a correlation, or... That's an interesting. That's an interesting question. And, but like, I like <laughs> but no. And actually, I do have. Some, I mean, it's. I do think that you know what happened in the 1980s, for real, is that violence rates went down, right? You know, and you know they've been going down, right? And um, and so actually, like you, you actually have a the uh, much safer. Uh, people actually are much safer. And I think that when they started to get much safer in reality, they started to sort of focus on uh, these, you know, things like uh, serial killers, you know, true crime stories. Um, uh, it almost is like it sort of was a re inverse to their actual level of danger. They started to uh, to sort of want to I don't know they wanted to gin up their own fear 
I, you know, but it is kind of, it is a fact, I do, I do think that there's a correlation between the, the sort of decline of real, you know, crime rates and the increase of, uh, you know, things like fascination with serial killers. And I think there's something like that was going on in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you guys so much. It's been a really interesting class, and I look forward to seeing you next week. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. 